I want to introduce to you our guest speaker today, Dr. Joe Savage, and uh, Dr. Savage and his wife. Um, is Pamela, is she in here right now? I didn't see her. Or, or she may be in the back, right? But she's here with him, and um, they lead a ministry um, in um, Moldova and in Europe, and uh, they're going to tell you more about that. But he's also the dean of the School of Christian Ministries and director of the Center of Leadership at the University of Mobile. And uh, he's also a dear friend of our pastor. Uh, they share a, a love for the University of Alabama. And um, in fact, uh, Dr. Joe has a relative involved in that program there. And he'll, he can tell you about his brother if he wants to. He's kind of like my brother. Sometimes I don't even talk about my brother. But, uh, but hey, we're glad to have you. You are in for a real treat um, with what he has to share today. And uh, what a blessing it was to, uh, to hear about the ministry that God has given to his family and how he has blessed his family and multiplied his family. And so I'm looking forward to hearing um, that again. And you will truly be blessed when you hear of the miracles that God is doing um, in this man and his wife's life today. Good morning, church. It is a blessing to be with you this morning. I hope you come back tonight hearing a pastor's message this morning and his story of how God is using him in his life. Uh, just encouraged me. We all have our stories to tell, and tonight I would like to share mine with you and how God delivered me and how uh, faithful God has been in my life. I want to sing this song for you uh, to encourage you this morning, to let you know no matter what's going on, God's got you right here. He's a trustworthy God, and He is a faithful God.
I don't know about y'all, but I think she sings pretty good. I wonder if I, that's tremendous, absolutely tremendous, and um, I don't know, I wonder if we'll get to sing in heaven like that, you think? If I can sing in heaven like that, what's she going to be able to do in heaven? It's unbelievable. But anyway, I wish, uh, it's good to be with you this morning. I have to admit, I wish I could, like, go sneak into the preschool nursery area and watch Ted Trailer today. I mean, I bet kids have gum in their hair right now, covered in food and everything. It's got to be hysterical back there. But I love your pastor. He's been a dear friend at the University of Mobile. He's on our board of regents over there. And, and uh, he has been such an inspiration to so many uh, guys going into ministry. And I know that because I'm the, the dean of the School of Christian Ministries at the University of Mobile, and I have the pleasure and the privilege every day to take about 100 students studying to be pastors, missionaries, church planters, what have you, and try to shape them and form them to be tomorrow's leaders around the world. And so um, the Lord has blessed us tremendously. A couple of years ago, we decided we were not going to uh, just prepare our students in a classroom and with a textbook. If that was the right way, Jesus would have done that with the disciples. And so we're still, of course, in the classroom because we're a university, but now we're actually more hands-on. And so we want our students out uh, emulating things that they see from people like Dr. Trailer. And you know, not, it's not just about preaching a sermon, it's also about loving and serving in the nursery. And that's phenomenal, and y'all know the kind of man uh, that, that Dr. Trailer is. And, one of the things that we've done is we took Acts 1-8 where it says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost ends of the earth. And we, we took it literal. And we've done 52 nations overseas. We've always got teams going out. And, but locally, this is what I'm really excited about. Our students, those 100 ministry students, they go out and they serve every single week at different ministries across the uh, Alabama Gulf Coast. In May, when the school year ended, they had completed, get this, 22,455 hours served in the name of Jesus over there in Alabama. And that, um, that, makes, that makes us the largest service organization in the entire state, and, uh, and secular or Christian, and so we're really proud of that and proud of our students for what they're doing. And uh, the other thing that's kind of neat that I want to share with you is just so you know and you can pray for us, is we've, we were doing great globally, doing great locally, but we felt like our nation was it's really in a mess, and y'all know that. We don't have to even go into it. And we felt like, well, the answer is not the government. The answer is the gospel. And so we turned around and we said, well, what if we could take the gospel to all 50 states in one school year? And we began to research it into our research and knowledge. No university or seminary in history had taken the gospel to all 50 states in one school year. So we're like, is this even doable? How are we going to do this? And we just prayed. And the more we prayed, the more God placed on our hearts to do it. So we said, well, let's go for it. And so we started going out and, and, and just sending students across the country. And y'all, the third weekend of April, we finished up our 50th state. And, uh, and our, our key leader, student leader, stood at the White House and prayed uh, over the White House. So we completed all 50 states in one school year. Uh, over there. So we're excited about that. And if you're, thank you, if, um, if you're interested at all in the University of Mobile, we even have an online degree now, or m multiple online degrees you can do fully from Pensacola. And uh, I'll be in the back at a table. Just come talk to me. Maybe I can get you a little scholarship money. Come talk to me. We'll see if we can make that happen too. But uh, I do want us to look at this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 10 today, verse 25. It's a familiar story that every person in here knows, at least even if this is your first time ever in church, you're familiar with the term of the story. And the term that I'm referring to is the story of the Good Samaritan. Of course, we always see a Good Samaritan as being someone who, you know, helps someone along the road or or, or loads up uh, uh, groceries in an in a elderly lady's car or something. And we call that a Good Samaritan, and it's true, it is. But Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan in a completely different context than how we understand the story of the Good Samaritan in today's terms. And that's what I want us to look at in Luke chapter 10, and we'll pick up, uh, we'll start at verse 25. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, and he tested Jesus saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
Now, that's a good question. That's probably the most asked question on the planet. Everyone here, I venture to say, has asked that question at least once in your life. Maybe you're here this morning asking it. How do I have eternal life? Is there a life hereafter? And if there is, what do I do to have that? It's a fundamental question. It's something that God puts deep inside of us to ask the question and look to the heavens and say, is there a God? Is Jesus real? And if so, do I know him and will I experience eternal life? And it's the question that this attorney was asking of Jesus. We see the same question asked three times in the New Testament. And they're all related in a similar answer by Jesus. And he says, Jesus answers with a question. He says, well, what's written in the law? What's your reading of it? And the man said, well, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So in simple terms, he said, the answer to how, how to have eternal life is to love God and love people. And Jesus says, you've answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. You see, John 3, 16, Romans 10, 9, and 10, all these other scriptures it talks about placing our faith in Christ is exactly true. It all coincides beautifully together because when you say, Jesus, I can't, Father, I, I sin, I can't come to you, but I need Jesus. I need a Savior to take my sin and take me to heaven because I can't get there on my own. That's the story of the gospel. That's the story of the good news of Christ. And so with that, having said that, the idea is when we say and acknowledge our insufficiency, and our dependency upon him in answer to that question, then God comes and resides within us. We know God personally, and it is, that, it is at that point in time that we can turn around and say, I love God, and he helps me to do that, and I also love my neighbor. I love other people as myself. Now, the first part of that is relatively easy for most of us here, though we mess it up sometimes, of course, and but we have a great church to come to and we come here and we worship and we hear beautiful singing like we just heard and we hear the great preaching from Dr. Trailer or wherever you might attend typically on Sundays and you hear these messages and we have the Bible and it's easy to say that we love God. So I'm not gonna focus so much on loving God with our whole being. I'm gonna focus on the second part of that because we can't be selective in which part we want. And the second part is loving your neighbor. That's the difficult part. I've got people that I don't like, much less love. Y'all the same way? I mean, is Olive the sole place in Pensacola where everybody loves everybody? I doubt it, right? So we've got this, this antagonistic fight that goes within us because God says your eternal life is based on do you love him and do you love other people how do you how are we doing how are you doing in loving other people now the neighbor here love your neighbor love others as yourself we're not talking about simply your neighbor next door or family members that's easy to love you see Jesus answers the question of eternal life and the question of who is your neighbor with the story of the Good Samaritan. So he gives us a definition of here's how he expects us to love our neighbors. Of course, loving God, but here's what he says is loving the neighbor. And what I've been is on this personal journey of late trying to figure out, well, if I really follow Jesus, then that means where he goes, I go. What he loves, I love. What he detests, I detest. Because if I turn around and only, if he begins to take me to a place that's not comfortable or a place that I don't like or a place that I'm not compassionate for or don't have an interest in, and I'm like, all right, I'm not going to do that one, then what happens there is I become selective in who I'm loving, and God didn't call us to be selective in who we love. He called us to love all people. And so the whole idea is if I choose when I want to love and who I want to love, then what happens is I set myself up like I'm little G God and now I'm the king of my, dom my domain and I utilize Jesus and I go with him when I want to, but when I'm not comfortable or don't like it, then I push it away. Does that make sense? So the whole thing for me and you today is 
How do we love people as Jesus said that we would love people? And what does he love? Because what he loves is where he goes. And where he goes is where I have to go. And he answers this question after this man asks an additional question. In verse 30, 29, he says, Jesus, now who is my neighbor? And Jesus says, let me tell you. He said, a certain man went down from, Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and he passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan shows up and cares for this man, and we'll look at that in just a moment. I want us to first look at, because it's important for us to understand the context of the story. Jesus is telling this man, he goes, you know the road that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho? The attorney understood the road because it was a major highway. Jerusalem sits 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho sits 800 feet below sea level. So between these two cities are 3,300 feet. The road is 17 miles long. In fact, there's a picture of the actual Jericho road. And it's 17 miles long. And can you imagine you're traveling 17 miles, 3,300 feet. And down that road, some parts of the road is good and it was, it's wide and it's safe. Other parts of the road have huge drop-offs, lots of rocks and boulders. It's difficult in spots. It was such a dangerous road that it was called the Bloody Highway. Now, it wasn't just called the Bloody Highway because of the Topography, in other words, the, the conditions of the road, it was also called the Bloody Highway foremost because it was one of the most crime-ridden roads in all of Israel. So when this guy says, who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. You know the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, the one that goes 17 miles, that goes, travels 3,300 feet? You know the Bloody Highway? The one that's full of thieves and crooks and robbers? Well, there was a man who was traveling down that road. And as he was traveling down the road, he became, he, he, somebody came up and they robbed him. And they beat him and they stripped him of his clothes and left him half naked. Now, here's what's interesting about the story is this. Jesus does not identify who this man is. He could have been rich. He could have been poor. He could have been famous. He could have been a nobody by society's terms. He could have been uh, uh, have a great job. He could have had a poor job. He could have been unemployed. We don't know anything about this man. This man may have been a really good man. This man may have been the biggest jerk in Jerusalem. We don't know. All that Jesus says when identifying what is our neighbor and what he wants instructs us as an example of this is how to love your neighbor. Here's a man that you don't know that's on the road in a great need. And he was robbed and beaten and, st and everything stolen from him so much so that they left him bloody and he was about to die. And the priest comes by, and they see him and pass by. The Levite comes by, which is a spiritual leader, and passes him by. Now, this road that we, this picture that you see, this portrayal of this story, let's put it in kind of modern-day terms. Let's say that you're going down the worst street in Pensacola, the most dangerous street, the bloodiest street in Pensacola. And as you're driving, you see a man laying there in the dirt like this guy, half-naked, beaten up, and as you approach him and you're coming down the road, would you stop? Mm. I don't think I would. Anybody else agree? Because a couple of reasons. One, I'm looking at that guy and I'm like, is this a setup? This is the bloody highway. I'm already kind of on edge because of the neighborhood I'm in. And here's this guy laid out there. This might all be a setup. And when I go help him, they're going to take me. Or it might be, and this is probably what more I would think is that dude has had the snot beat out of him and whoever beat him up is going to beat me up. He's still in the neighborhood. And I might have the last name Savage, but I can only do so much. I don't know that I want to get involved in this deal. And so I would pass by around him and say, oh, uh, that's for somebody else. But yet that's what Jesus describes as our neighbor. And that's who he instructs us to love. It's not that we select who we love or where we love or when we love. It's that we're to love when we leave this place and head home. It's when someone, God puts a, someone in our path who we don't know who needs our assistance. Now, 
the tragedy is this, and here's a little bit more behind the scene, and then we're going to kind of get into a solution of what love really looks like, is this. This man lying there beaten up, right, was in that condition so much so that the religious people still passed him by. On your way home today, and as you move across this city for work, how many people might we pass by, myself included, who God wanted to use us or you to help? Now, here's the thing. There were 12,000 priests and Levites who lived in Jericho. They were mandated by the religion of the day, the Judaism faith. They had, as Levites and priests, they had to travel to Jerusalem two times per year to serve in the temple. That means 12,000 priests, two trips a year, priests and Levites would walk the bloody highway 24,000 times per year, make the 17-mile journey. It was so common to have them on the road that the crooks were kind of hands-off. They were like, we don't touch people of the, of the cloth. And so they were hands-off. They didn't do anything to them. And, but here's the thing. Jesus says that the man was on his way down, which tells us this. The priest had been serving in the temple for an extended period of time. He's on his way home when he encounters the bloodied up man. Now, how does that equate to us? What's that have to do with me and you? This is what it has to do with me and you. This guy had been serving in the most religious temple, in the holiest city, in the whole planet, and he's on his way home. And, Jesus, and he passed by the guy who was in need, and Jesus used him forever and ever while we're on this earth to, as a demonstration of what, how not to love your neighbor in passing him by. In other words, when you come to church or maybe even serve as a Sunday school teacher or maybe you're on a worship team, maybe you're in some kind of choir, maybe you're in, you, you serve in the youth group or whatever, the bottom line is it's not what we do here that does matter, but it's also what we do when we leave this place. That's what loving the neighbor is. It's not the one sitting in the pew that you just shook hands with. It's the one on your way home that you've never laid eyes on before. And get this, the whole question of eternal life is attached to how you love these people. And you don't do it on your own accord. It's God loving through you to someone else. So this is a serious topic today. It's a very serious topic. It reminds me, though, of a story of a billionaire who lived out in West Texas. He was kind of like Jerry Jones. Any of y'all watch NFL, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys? Jerry Jones, I love the guy to death. He's a great owner. He's fun to watch and listen to. He's flamboyant. He's egotistical. And he likes to flaunt things. I mean, he likes to, to show off. And so this man in West Texas was like Jerry Jones, and he had brought all of his friends, relatives, politicians, media, all these people to his ranch for a party he wanted to throw. And when he got everybody there, they had this, he had this big swimming pool in his backyard, and he said, everybody gather around my pool. Now I want to show you my pool. And everybody came around the pool, and get this, he had flown in sharks and put sharks in his pool. So the pool was teeming with all these sharks. Can you imagine? And so he turns around and he says, now here's what we're going to do. The first one who jumps in the pool and can swim from one side to the other side, I'm going to give you a million dollars cash, a million dollar piece of property, or a million dollar stock in my company, whatever you want to do. And everybody's like, yeah, right. About that time, splash. Everybody gasped. They couldn't believe it. This guy's moving across the, the pool. I mean, he is swimming as hard as he can. He's swimming faster than Jesus walked on water. This guy is going. And he gets to the other side, and he pops out of the pool, and the billionaire walked over, and he goes, I never really thought anybody would do it, but I'm a man of my word in this big cowboy hat. And he said, do you want a million dollars cash, a million dollars stock in my company, or a million dollar piece of property? Your choice. And that old boy was bent over, trying to catch his breath, and he was going, I don't care what you give me. I just want to know who pushed me in the pool. <laughs> that old fella showed up for a party, and next thing you know, he's swimming for his life. 
Y'all, you know, I love that, that story, and it's funny. But the truth is this. The guy in the road, somebody pushed him in the pool. But let's personalize it for a moment. Maybe you, you feel like you've been pushed into a pool. You showed up and you thought life was going to bring you one thing, and next thing you know, it's not that. And maybe you, out of bad choices, jumped into the pool, swimming for something that was offered to you. Or maybe, just maybe, you don't know how you got in the pool that you're in right now, but you know that you're scared and you know that you're, you're, it's, it's not comforting and you're swimming for your life and you're trying to make it and you're, you feel like sharks are out after you and you just don't know if you're going to make it. I know some of you have been pushed into a pool called cancer. Some of you have been pushed into a pool of a broken marriage, a kid that's gone prodigal. Maybe some of you have been pushed into a pool because you've lost your job or you hate your job or you're trying to make ends meet and you don't seem to be able to have enough money. Listen to me, y'all. I don't know where we've gotten this American mentality as Christians that this is heaven on earth and that we want everything comfortable. But the bottom line, y'all, is this. Jesus said, in this world you will have many troubles. But he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, when you have Jesus within you, it doesn't mean that you aren't scared. It doesn't mean that it's, it's not difficult, it's not hard. But Jesus is with you, and he promised to be with you. I, I, I want to share with you, I'm not just sitting up here, I don't know, preaching a sermon. Yeah, what's he know? I, I, I want to pull the curtain back on, on my own life here for a moment and just share with you the pool that my wife and I have found ourselves in. When I was 26, and I won't go into the past and the circumstances, but when I was 26, I began to pray that God would let me have a child. I wanted to be a father. It's a normal prayer. And I began to pray in some circumstances developed that was not pretty, it was not good. And every Father's Day, I would cry because I wasn't a dad. And my wife is from Cleveland, Ohio, and I I had a ministry within the NFL, and I was living in Cleveland. My brother Phil, who was referred to earlier, was the general manager of the Browns. And I had gone to Cleveland. I was heartbroken, and I had met my wife, Pam, and convinced her to, to marry me and brought her down south and Start my job at the University of Mobile, have a wonderful job working for a wonderful person over there and ministry and speaking. And Well, we wanted to go ahead and start to have a child, and this was six years ago. And I'll never forget the, the gut feeling. I can feel it right now deep in my soul if I think about it too much. The gut feeling of sitting in the doctor's office and the doctor looking over after you've prayed for something for 19 years or so. And in that moment of a time he looks across the table his desk and he says I hate to tell y'all but it's more than likely you'll never be able to be a parent he said we can do in vitro if you like it's going to cost $25,000 though and we didn't have $25,000 but we I worked we saved money all year Pam worked family members helped and we put together $25,000 and Pam went in and she did the in vitro, and it was a 50% chance of it working, and it looked great. And get this, she got pregnant not with one, but with two. Isn't that awesome? And we praised God, and everybody was like, see how God answers prayer and stuff. And, well, a little time into the pregnancy, I was in Montgomery, Alabama, speaking at a function, and the phone rings, and it's Pam, and I could tell from her voice it was not a good call. And she looked at me, or she called, and she said, listen, I've miscarried both of the babies. I told my friend that was driving, I said, get there as fast as you can. And we drove, and I cried, and I talked to God, and I cried out to God, and I couldn't understand, why would God do that? 
And y'all, let me say something that's very candid. I guess you probably won't typically hear from a guest pastor, but I don't know. I'm sick of trying to be church and trying to fit this Christianese box when that's not what real life is. Real life is we're not perfect people and we make mistakes and we sin and by God's grace he helps us and we recover and he walks with us and he gives us eternal life. But y'all, let me share something. We felt like we were pushed in the pool, not by our choosing. And all I know is this, as I have prayed and sought the Lord in this whole situation, is I, I noticed something. People would say, praise Jesus when she got pregnant and God's so good, but when she... When she miscarried and we lost those two twins, people didn't know what to say to me anymore. And it was almost like, well, wait a minute. God's only good when he gives something. He's not good when he takes away something. Does this make sense? Why do we praise him when things are good? Why do we praise him when we get a job promotion? Why do we praise him when we get a new car? But when the car breaks down, we don't praise him. When we lose the job, we don't praise him. Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. If you're going to be a person of this book and you're going to follow Jesus, that path sometimes takes you into a valley and that valley hurts and that valley is lonely and that valley is dark and sometimes in that valley you think, am I going to make it and where is God in the midst of this? You see, even Jesus said from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's times and experiences driving down, right down this interstate out here where I would look to the top of the car and say, oh God, where are you? But at least I was still acknowledging there was a God and he was still going to be in my life. You see, God is good when you're in the top of the mountain and in the valley. And listen to me, if you've been pushed in the pool, if you're facing some of your darkest days, I'm telling you, I am absolutely telling you that in the midst of the valley, don't try to run from the valley. Drink from the waters of the valley. For waters run to the valley, and that's where you can drink of the Lord. The food grows in the valley. It doesn't grow on the mountaintop. Food grows in the valley, y'all. Let's quit trying to run to our places of comfort and our places of security and instead let God be God in our life in this downtime and the uptime because he loves us and he cares more about us than my career. He cares more about your character and who you are and having Christ in your life than your comfort. And I know we turn on the television and we hear all of this mumbo-jumbo stuff of saying, oh no, it's all about happiness. It's all about being this and being that. Listen, that's baloney. Open the book. The book is about joy in the midst of the pain, not just joy when everything goes well. You see, the testimony of God is joy in the midst of the darkness, not just when good things happen. That's what real faith is, is when it happens at your lowest of lows. And you still look up. And you still say, guess what? I may not know where God is right now, but I know this. He is in my heart, and he's with me. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's never going to leave me nor forsake me. I will cling to the cross. Now, I'll come back to that story in a moment. I want to show you something, though, of the story of the Good Samaritan. What Jesus said, here's how to love someone else. We pick up in it, in the story, in verse 33. He says, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now, here it is. I'm going to give you five ways to love your neighbor as Jesus describes it. Number one. And when he saw him, point one, love sees others. We have to have eyes to see. There's all kinds of needs that's around us all the time, isn't it? You turn on the radio, there's needs. You go to work, people are asking, there's needs. You come to church, there's always needs. There's all kinds of needs. One of the ones that gets me is late at night on television. You know those animal shelter commercials? Man, do y'all cry on those things? It's ridiculous. And they zoom in and they got that music. My wife and I are dog people. We got two little puppies. I guarantee you one of them's got the, the, the leg of the, of the chair, of the, of the couch in his belly right now while we're at church. And two little puppies, Zeke and Levi. I love those dogs. We're dog people. And those commercials at, 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 late at night and they'll zoom in and they're playing that music. And they got that lady's voice that's just soothing and just capture, captivating. And she says, 
as they zoom into this dog that's tail's half broken. He's walking around on three limbs. He's got a mange. I mean, he looks awful, right? And they zoom in and they're like, for $19.99, you can rescue this dog. And I'll be like, Pam, call and give them the credit card number. Do two of them. Then they turn around and they zoom in on the cat, and the cat looks horrific. I mean, he is beaten up. Looks like he's been ran over five times by an 18-wheeler and once by a train. Right? He looks awful, and they zoom in. For $19.99, you can rescue this cat. And I watch that, and all that good emotion goes away when I see a cat on television. <laughs> and I'm like, Pan, don't call him. Just let him kill the cat. Just kill the cat. <laughs> now, I'm sorry. Some of y'all are cat people. I get it. Look. Pastor Ted will be back next week. He'll clean it all up. (laughs) But y'all, the truth is, I say that kidding. The truth is there's all sorts of needs around us. And God wants us to open our eyes and see the needs. And the second part of that is he had compassion, it says. That's number two. Love has compassion. So love sees and love has compassion. And so I would venture to, 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 to... implore you to to simply every morning to say, God, help me to see as you want me to see. Help me to see people that you bring in my path. Maybe even today before you leave, you'll pray that. But the problem is this. The Levite, the the, the religious guys, the priest and Levite, they saw the man, did they not? So they saw him. They maybe even had compassion on him, but they didn't do anything about it. You see, seeing the need and having compassion for the person is not loving your neighbor. That's the beginning steps of loving your neighbor. So let's just not be emotionally moved by needs. Let's go help with the needs. And that's what the third point is here of loving your neighbor is love goes to others. Look at this. 34 is what separated the the, the Samaritan from the Levite and the priest. It says, so he went to him. As grand as this church is and as wonderful as Dr. Trailer's preaching and the music is and the programs and the different things, listen. God's more interested in how you go to your neighbor than how the congregation as a whole goes to the neighbor. Don't rely upon the church and the great things this church offers when God wants you to love someone. He's going to put someone in your path for you to see and have compassion for and then actually go to them. God never calls us just to to stay here and do ministry here. The ministry and loving your neighbor is outside of these walls. Yes, of course it's here. That's what Christian brothers and sisters do, but it's outside of these walls. It's tomorrow morning when you get to to, to, to work. So love sees and love has compassion and love goes. But this man that we see here in verse 34, he says, So he went to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took two denarii. That's equal to two days' worth of work, two days' wages. Gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. You see, love sees love has compassion for others love goes to others but love takes care of others the slide that you'll see here of the inn there's a literal inn that that would that sat seven miles outside of jericho it was at a crossroads a roman road and the jericho road crossed there's an intersection and so when jesus was telling this attorney you know that inn that's there on the way to jericho well the priest and the the Levite passed him by, but the man, the Samaritan, he blew his schedule up. He didn't worry about what he wanted to do or what he had already done. Instead, he went over to this man. He picked him up and let his blood get on him and his dirt get on him. And he put him on his own animal and he walked him to the inn. And that's literally a replica of what they think the inn looked like, by the way, on the screen. And they took him to the inn and he gave money and it says he stayed with him all night long. So he gave of his own sleep. And he stayed with the man, and he gave, his, uh, gave a couple of days' worth of, of money and said, if, if this doesn't cover everything, I'll pay you when I come back, meaning that the man's trustworthy in the community. People believe what he had to say. He took care of. So love, to really love your neighbor as Jesus defines it in this story, is love takes care of others and love gives to others. How do you have eternal life? Love God, love people. How do I love my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Let me tell you a story. 
It's not enough just to see y'all. It's not enough just to have compassion. But we must go to that person because when people are beaten down and they're pushed in the pool, they're laying in the road, some of them can't see for themselves. Some of them don't know what to do for themselves. And God wants us to be, God wants to use us so he can work through us to love that person and to help that person and to show them what real following, what really following Jesus means, what real eternal life is. That's what loving your neighbor is. Sixteen months ago, I had some students out at University of Mobile who were wanting to work with human trafficking. That's a big deal going on right now. And they also wanted to work with orphans. So I had a contact in the country of Moldova. Moldova is a part of the old Soviet Union that sits in Eastern Europe. It's the poorest nation in Europe. The average family makes $2,000 per year. But yet they pay European prices. It's a corrupt government. It's landlocked. The Russian mafia, it's a haven for the Russian mafia. And they go in and they take girls out of orphanages and they traffic them. So while we were there, and met with the embassy, U.S. Embassy and some other dignitaries and so forth, trying to figure out what we could do, I went out to one of the orphanages. And we gave them toys. We did a medical checkup. We shared Jesus with them. It was great. The picture they're going to show you is from my cell phone of three girls that were waiting in line to get a medical checkup. They're about 14 years old in this picture. Well, what I began to realize and became knowledgeable of is the Russian mafia, these girls at 16, they age out of the orphanage and they're out on the street. They have to come up with their own housing. That's when the Russian mafia targets them. They're pretty, they're poor, and they don't have parents. And what happens is when they take these girls, and this slide you're looking at, two out of three of these girls will become victims of human trafficking when they leave the orphanage at 16. When these girls become victims of trafficking, two out of three, they have 6,000 sexual encounters against their will, and they're dead on average in seven years. Now when I'm looking at these pretty faces and we're giving them a medical checkup and Jesus, I have to say, I'm like, really, is that enough? I'm going to turn around and give them Jesus and say, good luck. Hope you enjoy those 6,000 times and hope you have a nice life because you're dead in seven. You see, my Jericho Road, I didn't go looking for that. I was doing my duty and my job as the dean of the School of Christian Ministries in exposing students to human trafficking. But suddenly, now I saw these girls and we walked away and we're, there's a sense of I got to do more. I can't just see and have compassion. I have to go to them. I have to do something. So we began to pray and say, well, if they age out at 16, I wonder if we could create a home for girls so that they could come in a relationship with the state orphanage. So at 16, they come to our house, and we put them in an environment of Christian love. We keep them in school. We keep them safe. We show them how to, 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 to be a, a wife, a mom. And we just put them in a great environment and change the projection of their lives. But it was going to be $150,000 to get a house. We had to find house parents. It was like, how are we going to do this? Lord, we want to help. But, y'all, when you step out in faith to help the one that's in need, God tends to provide and take care of everything else. Three days before we were to come back to America, I met a man from Romania, and his wife is, was an orphan herself, and they're in Moldova, and they have a home, and they had three girls in this house, and they had the same vision that we had, but they were doing it. But they didn't have any money. They're eating chicken necks for, as part of their meals. They're, it was so cold on the inside of their house, they had two-by-fours around the bed with, with blankets covering it to stay warm in the zero-degree weather inside of the block house. And, but get this, we partnered with them, and now I want to show you, when we took a step out, this now is our house. Now, we began to pray in the state orphanage system, brings up some girls. Now we're up to eight girls in the house, but when they brought the girls, I'm like, I don't have the money. It's $200 per month per girl. How are we going to do that? 
And the church over in Mobile said, well, we'll cover a couple of the months, and they began to pay for that. And then people just started coming up. And I wasn't out soliciting money, but people kept coming up giving me money to help with this cost. And every single month, y'all, every single month, I would turn around and I would be, we would pray, and God would provide the money. And I remember uh, uh, earlier this year that I turned around, and I was at Panera Bread, and I was getting ready to eat a sandwich. And the text came in, and they said, we have no food over here. We're, we don't have hardly any food. Can you send us some money? I didn't have any money. And I turned around, I'm like, God, it's not right for me to eat, continue to eat like a, a sloppy American, just getting bigger and bigger, eating how many sandwiches can I eat when, I, when these girls are starving. So I left the sandwich. I'm not saying it's about me, but listen, love sacrifices. You have to give up something because you can, you can give without loving, but it's impossible to love without giving. And if we're to love our neighbor, we have to give to our neighbor. And it has to cost us something. And so we turned around and God provided and we began to pray and pray and God kept providing and these girls are doing great and they're, they're safe and now they've all received Christ and, the, and, the, and the, the older girls have all received Christ in their life. And, and I, wanna, I wanna just show you a couple of pictures real quick. This is Helen. Helen's our youngest kid, she's 11. She came from a little village, kind of an agricultural place. Her parents didn't want anything to do with her. Her daddy died or something. I don't know. They're gone. They're out of the picture. She went to live with an uncle. It was awful, horrible. I'm not going to get into how bad it was. Not here anyway. And the bottom line was it was horrible. She ends up at our house, and she's hard-nosed. She's trouble. We're trying to get her steered the right way. She is a project. She is hard. I show you a picture because I was with them at Christmas. The next picture and it's a picture of us at McDonald's, and she's got a McDonald's cup. And I, I, I look at that picture oftentimes because we went to McDonald's to give them some hot chocolate, and I didn't think anything about it, no big deal. It's McDonald's, right? Later in the day, she'd taken that cup home as a souvenir. The next picture is Maria. Maria's 18 years old. She's smart. She wants to be a linguist. In other words, she wants to be a translator and no languages. She's working on that and doing actually very well with that. She loves the Lord. She was one of the first girls in the house. And Maria didn't have a dress. And we were at the mall shopping for these girls. And while we're at this mall, some of my students came over and said, Dr. Savage, Maria sees a dress in, in one of these stores. And I'm like, well, how much does it cost? And they gave me the price. And I'm like, y'all, I mean, we can't afford that. Go find her something else. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, are you serious? You're kinda, you can't give up a meal so that that girl can have the dress that she wants. Does it matter how much does it cost? So I sent them where I'm like, y'all go buy the dress, who cares? And they went and bought the dress, and that's her and her dress on Christmas Day. And for three days, I never saw her without that dress on. And that's our pet parakeet. The next picture is Mariana on the left and Janika on the right. I'll say just a word about Mariana. She wants to be a hairstylist. She's smart. She loves the Lord. She grew up in the orphan system as well. And those pants she's got on came from Walmart and Fairhope. But she wants to be a hairstylist. She's always got something in her hair, like a flower or something. She loves Jesus. She's doing great. The next picture is Darina. Darina in this picture was 15. She was the first girl that I met. And Darina, when she came to us two years ago when the home first opened, she couldn't multiply two times two in a culture that's actually very educated. The reason is because her father died in a construction accident. Her mother wanted to abort her and is an alcoholic and is abusive of her and never, never let her really go to school or fulfill her education. It wasn't important. Instead, they worked her. she worked her like a dog. And she came to our house two years ago. And at Christmas, she had gone home to see her mother for Christmas right before I showed up. And I hugged her, and she pulled her shoulder back. And what I found out was when she had gone home, her mother, in a drunken tirade, had thrown her against the wall. That's Darina. The next picture, though, is significant. Remember my story? I wanted to tell something. This is on Christmas Eve. And we took them to eat at a little restaurant. And we're sitting there, and we're just talking, and Darina looked at me and said something that I had longed for for 19 years. It's Christmas Eve. It's zero degrees outside, sub-zero wind chill. I'm in Moldova, and this little beautiful girl looks at me, and she says, can I ask you something? And I said, yes. And she said, will you be my father? See, God's the father to the fatherless. In James 1, it says, real religion or pure and undefiled religion is to take care of widows and orphans in their distress. It's the only definition in the entirety of the Bible that God gives on what real religion looks like. 
And get this, as I venture down the road to follow Jesus, if he takes me to orphans, which he will because real religion is orphans and widows. So that means orphans and widows should be a part of every one of our lives without exception. Every 100% of the people in here today, widows and orphans should be a part of our lives because Jesus goes to the widow and orphan. He calls it in James 1, pure and undefiled religion. Well, now what am I to do? And God honored me by letting me be the father to the fathers. The next picture is Dorina and a girl named Alexandra. Alexandra's parents basically put her in the streets, her and her two brothers, when she was three. And she went to the orphanages. And while she was in the orphanages, and we won't get into it, but they were not kind to her. And she began to fight them back, and she was tough as nail. She takes taekwondo now. She can beat me up and not even think about it. Her name is Alexandra. She loves Alex. Zandra. She loves the ex. And she loves Jesus. A month ago, she got baptized, saved and baptized. She's doing great in our house. But Father's Day, what was that, in June, I think? Every Father's Day since I was 26, I cried. Except this one. Because it, my phone dinged and I looked down, and Alexandra sent me my first Father's Day card. Now, we began to pray and say, what can we do for these girls? And can we bring them to America? And it was almost impossible for that to occur because of the visa situation. And some people gave some money, and we had money to bring them. And we just prayed and prayed. Well, get this. On 4th of July, my girl showed up. Let me introduce you to them. Y'all come on up. Thank y'all. My message to you today is this in summation. I don't know why God does and allows things to happen. For us, I mean, even when we went down, and I didn't tell you all this. You can be seated just for a second. We were going to wrap up. I failed to tell y'all, I think. I get confused sometimes. I don't think I told y'all. We went the adoption route, and that's a glorious and wonderful thing. Some of y'all have adopted, and it's beautiful. Some of y'all have been adopted, and it's beautiful. For us, we had a girl this past August that was going to give us her baby, and she was due in August, and in July she stood in the foyer of a church, and she told my wife she wanted us to have her child, and we never heard from her again. We had the name picked out, the whole deal. It hurt. If you're laying in the road, in just a moment, I'm going to be down here, and some pastors are going to be down here. You're not on an island. You're not by yourself. All I know is I'm sorry for what you might be facing, but let God have his way in your life and let him work. You see, when we lost those two twins, I don't understand God. He turned it into four beautiful girls. So... Uh, I, And this is Dorina, right? Dorina on Christmas Day hugged me, and she said, as hard as I squeeze you is how much I love you. And she squeezed me, right? And I felt something pop back here. I'm like, oh, she broke my rib. She loves me so much. And then this is Alexandra, my bodyguard. Smart and Mariana, brilliant. They all love Jesus, y'all. Listen. I don't care what your background is. When you add God into the mix and the love of Christ into the mix, great things begin to happen. And Mariana, get this. It wasn't my university, but another college met with us last week. And Mariana has one more year of high school. And they, Maria has one more year of high school. Get this. They offered her a full ride next year. Isn't that unbelievable? 
And in fact, they turned around, it's, it's one of our Baptist schools, praise the Lord, it's cooperative dollars. And so they offered every one of these girls jobs. We've seen so many people pour out to them and help them. When they showed up to my house on 4th of July, they had a borrowed suitcase and they had two outfits. I looked down in one of their bags. She had two outfits and candy to give away to other people who had helped. Well, they ain't in two outfits anymore because they're looking like a million bucks. <laughs> and, y'all, I don't, again, I don't understand how God works and why he does what he does, but I want to close with saying this. If you're, in the, if you're on the road and you're hurting, God's there with you. If you don't know Jesus, quit waiting. Today's the day. Don't let anything get in the way. 